How many songs do you think you've written? Ooh, funny you should actually bring that up. Um, I started compiling all of the song lyrics that I've written. Wait, since... you who are OCD are doing something that's organizational? Yeah, um, I re- Okay, all right, re- I'll, 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 I'll I know it's a stretch. That. I'm, I'm retyping yeah. them. Um, printing them up, <laughs> alphabetizing them, not by the, by the year that they were written, but just so that I can find them just to revisit some of that. Um, and I think I'm at about 300 songs since I started writing in eighth grade. Oh my God. <laughs> I know. Now I'm not saying they're all good. I'm not saying they're all good, but it, you, you know, did not say that. You did nope, not say that. No, and and you know sometimes I I revisit these things as I'm as I'm putting them into the computer and I look and I say and it's really I'm focusing on the lyrics in terms of the uh, um, the poetry book that I think I'm going to possibly release at some point. Um, uh-huh. Just to sort of get an idea of like what 15 year old Eric was thinking when 55 year old Eric <laughs> is reading those lyrics, you know, and what still resonates and what is like, what was I thinking? <laughs> right. Right. I wrote this? If I only knew. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am fascinated to hear you discuss this part of your, your process, this part of your hero's journey. In the previous conversation, we talked about how you know, we use that model, obviously, to reflect on things which were the broad strokes of our life. Um, and there are journeys within a journey. So you have your own particular version of how you might respond to those standard ways of thinking about a journey mm-hmm. in, in just the focus of your own creative um, uh, way of being alive through this artwork of, you know, creating music and song. Mm-hmm. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really, uh, excited to, to hear what you got to say about that. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to sharing it with you and the listeners. All right, well, let's get into it. Welcome to the heart of the cards, a conversation about creativity, inspiration, and dealing with what we're dealt. Hey, this is Dan Green and Eric Stewart. And this is episode 22 of The Heart of the Cards. And we're talking with Eric Stewart. Who? About his, uh, this this schlub I know, <laughs> um, I occasionally speak to. I know. Um, <laughs> and when he says occasionally, it's like every 15 to 20 minutes. But that's fine. Uh, yeah. That's still I, occasionally. I, was, I didn't know that a restraining order could be put out on <laughs> a phone number. Because, you know, like my phone. But your wife found a way. That's uh, right. It, it can't That's right. It can't text you at certain right. times. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so even though we've known each other for a good number of years mm-hmm. and have worked on uh, a number of things, and I have always been aware of and uh, your singing and songwriting, and I've attended a number of your performances, and I, I married someone who was also a singer-songwriter, mm-hmm. so I, I feel like I have some some awareness of those kinds of things. But nobody uh, approaches their creative expression in exactly the same way, right? even in the same form of expression. And um, yeah, so I'm just really fascinated by how how you're going to respond to some some very basic ways of, of looking at what you've done. And I'm also, you know, whatever you want to say about it, of course, I'm, sure. I'm, I'm eager to hear as well. But if yeah. we were just to, you know, if I asked you a very simple question straight up, which was how many songs, mm-hmm. right? That can be quantified. Probably that's the easiest thing to quantify about a process of yes. creative expression. Yes, I can count. <laughs> how many of these are there? Okay. <laughs> and interestingly, you quickly backed that up with a, a self-effacing reference of you didn't say they were all good. Right. Um, uh, but as somebody who also makes stuff, you know, I, I understand what you mean. I mean, that's also a truthful, although somewhat amusing response. Yeah. yeah not all of our stuff is gold. <laughs> right. But that's that's doesn't invalidate the process, and that doesn't mean that you shouldn't, um, you know, keep doing what you're doing. Right, and so, they are being documented, even as you just, you know, part of the process. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And there's that old saying, and it's been around because it's true. You learn from your mistakes. Yes, you learn why this wasn't quite enough. Mm-hmm. And yeah, right, definitely those sorts of things. So yeah, so. Here, here's another pretty easy uh, general question. Sure. When this started for you, and it, you 
were in eighth grade, or yep. that's when you you know are, you have some some receipts, some evidence. Yes. Here's yes. here's these lyrics. Um, so it's like the call to adventure in in the sense of you follow the you don't all of a sudden just make a song. Right. It takes obviously things can you know spontaneously occur to you, um, but there's also the process of making. So, when did that happen, and why was that compelling for you? So we talked about um, my early school years and the weird, crazy, cool uh, school that I went to, St. Anne's in Brooklyn Heights, right. um, and the music class, and how we were. You know, basically, our teacher decided to to get through to these teenagers um, or preteens, um, you know, how to pay attention in class. Let's form a rock band. And right, right. the introduction to the classic rock bands that I liked um, and learning how to play their songs um, was really the education for me about the starting of songwriting, because so much of rock music is so similar, but what makes it different yeah. might be the melody that's going over those same chords or, or the, the cool lyric that is going over the, that same melody that you might go, Hey, wait a second. That sounds just like that other song, which of course, uh, you know, current events will tell you there's a lot of lawsuits that go on with that too. Um, that's a tricky, oh, yeah. tricky oh, yeah. part. Um, but once I started to learn songs by like the who and the stones and uh who else was on our list at that time i think bob seger and all of these mm. cool classic <laughs> rock kind of um uh, artists once i realized what they were doing in terms of the music part i thought huh i can play three or four chords like this in a different pattern and maybe come up with something of my own. Not really even thinking um, I need to replace these covers, as we call them, um, with originals, but more of, oh, well, if that's how it's done, why can't I do that myself? Um, Mm. And whatever would become of it wasn't even on the the radar at that moment. But um, I think for me, I related yeah. to a lot of those lyrics. A lot of those songs okay. were about angst. They were about, uh, you know, heartache and things like that. And, you know, being, uh, you know, in eighth grade, you know, or, you know, 12 years old or 13 years old and so many things changing in your life and trying to figure out. I have who, no idea what you're talking about. I know. I, for me, it was I, a brief. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I knew, I knew, um, you know, I, I I had a sort of reference of of what love was supposed to be, and and uh, mm. there's definitely <laughs> a lot of those, you know, uh, fifth grade, you know, puppy oh, dog, yeah. you know, puppy love oh, yeah. kind of moments. Um, but I also wanted to be able to write songs to the girls I liked. And it was one. You seducer. Well, you Just know, kidding. I was once on a radio show where they said, so tell me, why did you first start playing guitar? And I said, because I wanted to meet girls. And they said, finally, someone just says that as the first answer. Like, you know, <laughs> I know, but I mean, quite, quite but, like it's, it was part of the, it, no, I was going to say it's part of the, it was part of the, the, the presentation. I, you know, I was a new kid sure. at my school. Uh, I used humor to, to make friends. Um, sure. And, and I also thought this was a way that I could personalize this and maybe get a girlfriend. Right. And there's nothing brockish about that at all. Not at just all. Not, <laughs> Not at, at all. all. No, I just needed to pick it, one instead of two, like Brock. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. There you go. Um, but the way that it's funny because it's so predictable. So it's easy to laugh at from that perspective. Mm-hmm. But in a more primitive way, in a more basic way, in terms of just how human beings are, that's a huge drive. Of that, I mean, I don't know if I've ever felt more excessively romantic, <laughs> right, mm-hmm. uh, than in that time when those uh, those chemicals are surging through your body and, and uh, I mean, you're literally experiencing things in a fuller way. So I, I think to express yourself creatively could be laughed at as just, oh, just, you know, trying to meet chicks. But um, 
but I think there's also something very genuine about that. Yeah. I think everybody who's creative, you know, I, I mean, I certainly drew pictures for for the, the, the women that I was enamored with. And, mm-hmm. You know, that was a part of the way I tried to impress them. But, uh, yeah. And also but, it's, it's like the difference between giving somebody a store-bought card for, the, for, <laughs> yeah, their, for yeah. their birthday or Valentine's Day, which is fine, or, yeah. you know, um, drawing it yourself and... Even if it's not a good drawing, it's just there's something very personal about it. And I thought, I thought, it, you know, it's one thing to uh, play these songs in front of people. And yes, the, some of those girls were in front of me while I played these songs, um, the, the, the covers. Um, and that sure, would be like, sure. oh, he's a good singer and look, you know, whatever he's, he, you know, he, he can play the guitar. But if it's like, hey, I wrote this for you, um, that's really, that was really a way to sort of try to connect um, and not really right. to, you know, right. it wasn't like I was writing songs for all the girls in my school. Um, you know, th- if I had a crush on someone, <laughs> I wrote them a song and sometimes mm-hmm. they, mm-hmm. you know, said that's very romantic and they liked it. And sometimes they were just like, you know, leave me alone, um, which I did. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was kind of what started it. And, you know, looking back, um, through my, my catalog of songs, um, you know, I, I wrote from a relationship, either being in love or losing love or whatever. That was that was a common sort of theme for so long. Um, even it, whether, whether it's a comedic song, it's tongue in cheek. It was always about that, because I, I think that relationships just in general, whether it's, you know, platonic or you know, family, whatever it is, or romantic, um, we're such a key part of who I am um, in terms of connecting and um, mm-hmm. and also having mm-hmm. people relate to um, maybe what I was going through or uh, to see if that if it wasn't just me. Um, you know, you play a song about, you know, uh, a, a bad breakup and people in the audience might say, oh, that's just like what happened to me. I, I know I know what I know what you're going through or I can relate to that. Um, yeah, and also sure. as the artist to say, huh, they really enjoyed that heartbreaking song. I guess I'm not the only one who's been through that. So it's not just me. Right. <laughs> I, I, I'm right. part of I'm part of a community. Uh, and the same thing with happiness. It's like it's, um, you know, bringing the joy and seeing that people relate to that, too. Um so that's what started me saying, you know what? These are fun songs to play that were written by other people. Let me try to do it my own way. Mm-hmm. And you said that the angst that you were um, hearing in some of that music that you mo- that you you know that you dove into mm-hmm. learn how to do um, that that angst thread was that part of th- this was helping put voice to things that you were feeling inside. Definitely, um, you know with. With the the home life situation of my of my dad, you know, basically being kicked out at you know when I was uh-huh. four because of his infidelity, um, and um, you know, just being you know with my mom and you know just the two of us, uh, I I definitely was an angry young man. And bands like the Who and the Stones had that edge yeah. that I really yeah. liked, or Led Zeppelin or ACDC, things that were just you know aggressive, but. It's not like I was writing stuff like that in that style, but I liked, I liked their messages. I liked the the lyrical messages that were in there. Um, it wasn't all fluff, um, and I felt like that was that was a mm-hmm. good way mm-hmm. to uh, get some of my own thoughts out. I mean, I truly believe that if I did not write or I didn't have a guitar near me and I didn't have that outlet. Um, I would be in a very, very dark place more often. Um, this was my way of, mm-hmm. of venting, mm-hmm. of, 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 of getting those things out and then seeing if I could at least move on. Or, you know, some of these songs have stayed with me for years. I, I still enjoy playing them, even though I'm not hmm. the guy that mm-hmm. wrote them, meaning today's <laughs> right. version of Eric. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. I know what you mean. Um, it's you from another era. Yeah. Um, uh, so... Let's talk a little bit about when do you feel, and this is referencing again, not everything you make is amazing. Right. What was the first song or what were the, some of the first couple songs that you made and afterward you were like, 
oh yeah, you 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 impressed yourself. You respected what you created. Yeah. So very. I know. I know that there's. I know there's a there's a you know there's a dial for everything. Yeah. But, no. Know. But there's been some things from the early days that I look back and I say, wow. So you know, fifteen yeah. year old or sixteen year old Eric wrote that. That's kind of cool that I was thinking that way. Uh huh. Um, uh huh. One title that pops into my head from way back, um, probably from one of the first recordings I ever did with my partner, Martin Schneider, who played in my duo band. We were called ARQ, which stood for nothing. And we would tell people it was actually another ridiculous question when they asked what it stood for. Um, which, anyway, it was the 80s. Give us a break. Um, but... It you was could a, pronounce that like arc, I guess. Yeah, but uh, we had we had periods between them. Um, but but not it was oh, a period, R period, Q. There was no period after the Q. So you figure it out. Um, so mm. the the title of the song was called "An Even Petaled Flower." Wow. And the hook was, "She loves me not." Pretty clever. And pretty clever. Yeah. I mean, I think even the guy so says, she loves me, she loves me. And then it's a, she, it ends with she loves me not because of the fact that it's an even petaled flower. Um, and I thought that's pretty cool. That's poetic. Yeah. And and it's a cool, you know, synthy, dancey, kind of a little dark, <laughs> but still catchy tune. Um, you know, the the. The style of my writing in terms of being <laughs> melodic, but, the, you know, and, and maybe catchy, but you realize that I'm singing some darker things has always been okay. what I, you know, I want you to, I want you to enjoy the music side of it, but I also want you to think when you've heard this, the lyrics and want to listen to it again to make sure you didn't miss something from that part of it. Right. So, uh, right. yeah. So that was, that was one of the early ones where I was like, yeah, that's pretty cool for a young guy to have come up with. <laughs> Very good. And and when you were performing, was there a part where I'm assuming the transition was something along the lines of you're doing covers, right? Mm-hmm. Your interpretation of other people's songs. And and the other end of that spectrum is your own stuff. Were there points in between where you mixed? Like you did a couple of covers, you did one of your own. Very Wait, like very just rarely. testing the waters as it were. So okay, so very rarely. My my performance journey with with original music is kind of a little backwards because okay. so we, we we played live in eighth grade with this with this project to the rock school thing. Um and then we we continued on with our own little band for the next year or so where we were playing covers and with me sneaking in an original here and there as we were sort of getting all, everyone was ready to go to college and um and you know focusing on other things and so as the band slowly sort of um you know broke up we're still all friends um it became like, OK, well, Eric's writing more songs for this project. Eric's writing more songs for this project. And then once there was a catalog of original material, we were down to the two band members that still wanted to play music, which was, you know, me and my buddy Martin. And so the next phase was let's go to the recording studio and record these. So we didn't even play these songs live very much, except working them out before we went to the studio as a duo, we went into the studio and created them. And then we had this catalog of recorded material. And we did that for a while before we even thought about performing live. And I mean, not to jump ahead too much, but when the when the opportunity came for me to play some bigger shows in New York City, um, my buddy Martin, who's still one of my best friends in the whole world, was like, listen, I hope you don't hate me, but I think this is really your dream to go to this next level. It's not mine, and I don't want to hold you back. I love what we've done, but like, I don't think a career in the music industry is what I'm really ready for, or that's what I really mm. want to do. So mm-hmm. then I started to put together a band to play my music live. So it was mm-hmm. really interesting to learn about a lot of songwriting from the recording process and then trying to take those songs that were created in the studio 
and turning turning right. them into a live version was like okay <laughs> all those crazy keyboard parts in the horn section and all the things I'm doing in the studio yeah I can't really do that with a four piece rock and roll band with two guitar players a bass and a drum right You're gonna have to figure out a different interpretation of this so um, that was an interesting mm-hmm. transition but yeah no I we only did when we were playing live in that incarnation of the band um, after the recording situation um, as a four piece. We played two covers in my in my whole like set um, for, mm. for a couple of years. One was Tears of a Clown by Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, but we played it like the um, English beat version, very up ska fun version that, oh, okay. that they did. Cool. So we did cool. their version of Smokey's song. And then we did Burning Love by Elvis because it's Elvis. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, and we did that I've as a that fun guy. little tongue-in-cheek yeah. kind of closing song every once in a while. But everything else was pretty much, if it was a more legitimate show, uh, none of that stuff was in there. If it was, hey, uh-huh. we booked you guys for like, you know, two hours and uh, we're like, well, I've got a lot of songs, obviously, but I don't have enough for that at that time. Let's put in a couple of these fun little covers. But Primarily, it was, mm-hmm. oh, if I like that song, let me do something like it that I wrote. That r- was really my thing. Was my, The challenge was, okay, that's a cool vibe. Can I do something like that that doesn't sound like I've ripped it off, but I've, I've captured that <laughs> vibe? Right, 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 right. Well, um, this is reminding me a bit of when, the way that you experience something that you become a fan of part of it is it's speaking to something within you Mm -hmm. and and you said that yeah these 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 songs were basically saying things that i i was feeling and and now you have a a new it's it's maybe uh compared to a vocabulary yeah but you have a way of expressing yourself that you're borrowing you know you're borrowing the language but you're saying your own thing yes yeah yeah that's really cool yeah and the and the process too, like, you know, no two songs have ever been approached the same way for me, and and no, mm-hmm. um, there's no rhyme or reason to my creative process. And some people are very methodical; they can set up writing appointments with people. I primarily write alone. Um, I do some co-writing in Nashville, but I primarily write alone. Um, not to say that that's better than writing with someone else, but I prefer that. And mm-hmm. I know people that can say, well, every Tuesday, my buddy and I get together when we, we write at 930 in the morning and then we grab some coffee at noon and then we finish it up tomorrow, the, you know, the next day. Um, I tried that a couple of times and it's very hard for me to be creative on the clock, on schedule. That doesn't happen. So Mm -hmm. for those who are in, you know, that style of creativity, (laughs) follow that path. Um, I'll just give you a little taste of like I'm writing on I'm writing a song right now. Okay, Um, Mm -hmm. I'm working on a song right now uh, where I had the music. I I sat down and I and I wrote this really cool groove um, on keyboards, and I'm I'm not a keyboard player, but sometimes I just grab the nearest instrument that's in my studio and say, I feel like I'm going to write with this today. Um, what's nice about the keyboards is every note's in front of your face, so you can see them. So if you want, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's nice. Um, I wrote this track, and I was like, I, I really like this vibe. Um, and I had no idea for a title. I had no idea for any of the of the lyrics. And I started to fully produce it. I figured hmm. this feels like the right length for a verse and this is a right length for a chorus and I should do a cool bridge here. And I basically structured the whole song in Pro Tools with my placeholder instruments because I do like to use real drums and real bass and, and real guitars. Mm. But I put all of these mm-hmm. things in place just to get a sense of what I was doing. And then what I do for some of my songs is I jump in the booth and I sing nonsense cadence words and I say words with quotes around them to (laughs) as a placeholder to the melody and the phrasing and it doesn't sound you know sometimes it sounds like I'm saying words I'm not 
Um, it's all gibberish, but it's gibberish mm-hmm. in a map that gives me, oh, that's the melody that's in my head. Okay, I got that. And it's not la-la-la-la-las. It's actually, you know, if it, I mix it into the track enough so that, you know, someone hearing this, you know, on a radio would think, oh, I didn't catch all of his lyrics, but did he say something about the sun and the what's going on? Yeah, I mean, it almost sounds like I'm saying words, but I do that, and then I have that as my reference. I also mm-hmm. do a mix with none of those uh, nonsense vocals. So I have an instrumental version, and both of those things uh-huh. go on a playlist. Right, right. And so, right, right. I, you know, I might I might be doing something in the house. I might be cooking something, and I've got the I've got the full version playing with the melody that is in my head. And then the next version is the instrumental, where I can sing against it if I've come up with some lyrics here and there. Now, as I said, this is the process for this particular song and some others in the past. But I don't always write like this. Um, this mm-hmm. particular song has taken me probably five months to write. And it's not because I don't like it. It's because I don't know what I want to say this time 100%. I kind of have a concept because I found Mm -hmm. the title, which I don't always start with. And I have an, an interesting way to address this concept, which is ironic because it's almost like singing about writer's block. It's almost, the song is almost <laughs> about how when you don't feed your, your, uh, your creativity, <laughs> your, 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 your soul is starving. Um, and, right. and so I thought, well, there, there, there's some irony right there. So, um, but I've been writing it in, in chunks. I think I just finished there's two verses and a bridge. I have both of the verses pretty much locked. The bridge is close, but I don't have the choruses yet. I, I have the I have the hook lyric, but I don't have the the rest of the words that go around it. And I don't know Very when it's gonna happen. I'm right. not feeling the pressure because I've got some, you know, due date that it's gonna be You have over three hundred songs, my friend. Right. You don't who's breathing down your neck to make another But one? it's just right. but but you know where creativity and where those ideas hit me, um, I jot down notes on my phone, okay? I sing into my mm-hmm. phone. Um, mm-hmm. Usually it's when I'm not doing um, something in the studio that actually triggers my creativity. Um, early in the morning, before my coffee kicks in, I will put my headphones on and sit in the backyard and listen to that rough mix with my phone next to me ready to type in a lyric or two if it comes to me, because I'm not quite awake mm-hmm. yet. I find that sort of, you know, a sleepwalking uh, time, almost my mind is clear. Right, uh, it's it's right. not being clouded by other things so that I can just digest what the melody is and, and maybe what I want to say. Um, or on the plane, with all the traveling that we do, um, I find that I'll listen to that track over and over again. It's a good thing I have headphones on because mm-hmm. if my wife heard that song as many times as I listened to it, she would kill me. <laughs> um, uh. and, and it, but it's but that's part of the process. I saw once they had uh, uh, the scuba diving uh, chalkboard that you can write on underwater. I want to get one of those for my shower so that when an idea <laughs> comes to me, I can write it on that chalkboard while I'm sure. it, getting you know all wet. Um, Sure. So, sure. yeah. And it's, you know, I, I know people that start with a title and they and they start with, you know, they they they're all the, the uh, metaphors are there. And 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 some songs are like that. Some songs evolve from that. But um, I don't know it, 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 it. What you're trying to say, because nothing I mean, nothing is really new, but it's just the newer way to say that thing. So how mm-hmm. do I. How do I put those words together? And I'm I'm also a big stickler about lyrics. Now, uh, there's a great publisher named Lou Levy who said, no one hums the words, which is true. So the melody is, of course, the thing that gets stuck in your head. But mm-hmm. I want, when that melody is stuck in your head and you're singing those words, for you to also say, now that is a great way to say that, or these words are clever. Um, 
or these words are fun, whatever. I don't want it to sound like filler. I mean, some, right, some right. of the best songs I've rediscovered on a second or third listen because I've I've understood the nuance of what they were also saying, the double meaning in some things, which is just, I mean, that's to me what smart writing is about. Sure, sure. Yeah, Prince isn't talking necessarily about an actual little red Corvette. There you go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> exactly. Or uh, the the great uh, um, Leonard Cohen song, um, Hallelujah, minor third, the major lift. Well, that's also what's happening in the music. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, just brilliant stuff. Um, I love that stuff. Um, uh, I I I look for that. And so um, the thing that takes me the longest to finish whenever I'm writing is, okay, I've got the, the, the music's there, the melody's there, and the lyrics are the things that I fine-tune. I listen and I listen and I say, do you really need to say the there? Should it be a? Uh? Should it be, you know, is that is this one too many mm-hmm. syllables in that phrase? You know, does it sound like it's, you know, it's grooving with it or, or does it sound like I'm jamming too many words in there? Um, mm-hmm. All little things mm-hmm. like that. That's what I really work. And I don't know if people really listen the way that I'm hoping that they're going to listen. Um, but if they do, I want to I want to get that. Hey, man, that was really smart. What you what you how you said that that was very clever. So that's one response that you would take to heart. Yes. Right. Because whenever we make stuff, we're trying to do some things well. Yes. So when we get that reflected back, yes, you're doing that. We like this about what you've done. That's very affirming. That's very rewarding. Yes. Um, so I know you describe this current one as being not necessarily representative, but it seemed what you were saying just just in that last little bit, mm-hmm. you do take a while before you finalize the words. Yes. Is that fair to say? Okay. Yeah, it is. But it also, I sometimes will come up with the the basic structure of the words much faster. And then I'm just fine tuning sure, sure. the whole piece, right? It'll just flow. Mm-hmm. I'll be like, oh, this is great. And then sometimes it's like, my goodness, I don't even know. Like I have word documents where I have, because, t- mm-hmm. you know, with my OCD, I type in phrases that I like when I'm writing a song like this. And there okay. must be yeah. three or four pages of what could be fine verses. That's good. That would work. <laughs> I-, I like that. That worked on, you know, yesterday that looked good. And then I revisit. I'm like, no, that's not what I want to say. Um, you know, maybe if I had a song that had 10 verses in it, I could include all of them and some of them would be better than others. But no, there's only two verses. They both have to be something that I like, like that mm-hmm. I want to say. And that's where you're asking about uh, the feedback. Yeah, I would, l- I would love for the listener to... Um, enjoy the nuances that I'm putting into that, especially with the words. But if I can't listen to my own music and there's some stuff that's <laughs> a little tough to listen to that some of the older things I'm like, Oh boy. Um, but, uh, if yeah, I, yeah. if I don't enjoy it, then <clears throat> that to me is where I say it's good or it's bad. I don't really care if it's like, well, you know, of your fans like this song and 25%, you know, don't. And I'll be like, well, I guess that's Mm -hmm. a good song. I don't like that song that much. So that's not one of my favorites. Um, I like that people like what I do when they like it, but I really have to enjoy it. And when I find myself putting on something in the car that I did a couple of years ago or 10 years ago or whatever or yesterday, and I'm enjoying listening to it as a listener not as Eric who made it, um, mm-hmm. which I'm able to separate, which I, I don't know if people will right, believe you can me, be objective. But I really so I sometimes know. just put it mean. on and just go, am I enjoying the song? Yeah, I'm enjoying the song. I'm rocking yeah. out. I'm having fun. Yeah. You know? I appreciate what you mean. And I think it, it might be something that is harder for, for people who don't create stuff and then look at it yeah. to understand. But there, you can attain a level of objectivity about what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And, and you can do that while you're creating it, I think it's also, you would probably agree, 
uh, objectivity is easier to achieve after you've had some time between when you made it and when you're looking back on it. Yes, um, yes. And also helps pe- a lot. And people, people who get frustrated with the creative process, which I will be part of that, you know, I, 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 for the rest of my life, there are times that I either go, I got to step away from this for a, a week, you know, a month yeah, or a, sure. an hour. Um, taking those breaks and just reassessing what you're doing is fine, um, especially when you're doing stuff for yourself, not when it's, you know, if it's a, mm-hmm. if it's a job mm-hmm. and you've got a deadline, I understand, but um, we all get burnt out and we all start overthinking the things that we're doing when we're trying to get our ideas out, whether it's on paper or, you know, in the computer to sing stuff or just in front of an audience, whatever you're doing. Um, we all we all start to overthink that stuff. And um, which is another reason why I rarely share rough ideas as a songwriter. I mm-hmm. I feel mm-hmm. like. I know where I kind of want it to go, but it's not formed enough that I'm ready for any critique or trying to explain what I'm doing to someone when I share it to, with them. Now, you and I have a relationship, a creative relationship that I think I could do that with you because I'm also sure, gonna, I'm not sure. going to ask you, hey, what do you think of where I'm going with this? Unless that's what I'm going to ask you. Um I could say I'm working on this new thing. It's it's a lot of fun, and you might say, "Hey, yeah, it, that's cool. I'm digging it, right?" And that's great. Same thing you could share with me, you know, a sketch, an idea, a, 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 you know, a, a synopsis of a story. Oh, absolutely, I um, absolutely. Because we, there's that safe space to do that. But rarely do I share what I'm writing because I also I know from past experiences. It's probably not going to be those words for the for the final. They're placeholders. Mm-hmm. Even when I come mm-hmm. up with cert- real words to fill the nonsense that I use <laughs> as my guide track, um, sometimes those are just placeholders because I I I'm stuck on line two of verse two, and I'm just going to put in words right. that of that that make that sound right, but don't mean that they don't mean the right thing, but they sound right, and right. I'm not ready for. Right. What are you saying there? I don't even know what that means. Like you're mixing metaphors. Right. And, not, yeah. Right. Not everybody's going to understand those elements of your constructive process. Yes. So yeah, better to not share it because you don't want to over-explain or yes. justify. Or, yes. Right. Okay. So we've covered a lot of bases here and I think people get a sense of what you do in, your, in terms of your process and what led you into this. I'd like to hear about some of the... You know this this idea of of apotheosis. You you actually addressed that in, in, when we uh, had that episode of the Heart of the Cards. Mm-hmm. But think, let's think of this a little bit more broadly. What were some of your like three peak experiences as a songwriter? That doesn't necessarily mean it was a performance. Okay. And yeah, yeah. No, that's a good question. Um, the first one that comes to mind. I wrote a song that was a piano ballad with a string section and just my vocal. That, Very fancy. Um, yeah, right? I wanted to do something in the style of Morning Has Broken by Cat Stevens. That's kind of the uh-huh. vibe that I was going for. It's a song called A Boy in Love With You. And it's a very real story of how, even though he is not... Uh, perfect and that he is flawed with all of the mistakes he makes in other parts of his life, at the end of the day, the one thing he can say with confidence is he'll always be a boy in love with her or a boy in love Mm -hmm. with you. And it's a very Mm -hmm. real personal tale, a very honest Mm -hmm. love song. And and I loved performing. I mean, I loved recording it. uh, And I would play it a little bit here and there uh, live, not with the string section, didn't have that then. Um, But... (laughs) The reason I bring that song up is because uh, a good friend of mine, when he went to uh, get married, uh, he asked <laughs> me to play that at his wedding. And I said, um, did, you did listen to the full lyrics, right? Like, mm. he talks about how he's uh, not perfect. <laughs> he's talking about the mistakes in his life. And I mean, it's not a hundred percent all positive things. 
And he's like, mm-hmm. yeah, but it's very real. And the message is still, no matter what else goes on, I'll always be the boy in love with you. Um, and I was like, okay, I never thought of this as a wedding song, but now it is. So that was a, a, a great compliment. Um, and, and just, it was one of those things where, you know, playing it with that, um, spotlight in front of the wedding mm-hmm. party, the um, context, yeah. knowing yeah. that, yeah. Knowing that, I mean, it, I was, I was overcome with emotion. It was tough to get through it. Um, because it was so romantic. Like, I just thought, my goodness, here's the guy that started writing songs to meet girls in middle school to get them <laughs> to fall in love with him. And here's a song that you wrote that is for, for two people that fell in love with each other. Like, what a great, mm-hmm. you know, what a great sort of like tool for, for romance, right? Something that I helped create. <laughs> um, so that was one. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, uh, I I would have to say an, another song that meant a lot to me was uh, a song called Lost Innocence. And mm. it's a song that was on the, the Frampton produced album that we did as the Eric Stewart Band. And nice mid-tempo, dramatic kind of folky song. But the lyrics in that one were all like truly fine tuned and one that just it just it, it was like full on flow coming out of me. I interesting. I I didn't have a hard time writing this one, but there's mm-hmm. all sorts of the 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 black and the white, the 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 right and the left, the the the, the opposites in the song. Um you know, have I learned anything now that I've become older? And of course, I think I wrote it when I was 30. Um or have I lost in a sense was the tagline of the chorus. But there's a line in there where I say, uh, I've saved the day, but spent the night. So it's things like that, where it's like I I loved the lyric in that. And people seem to relate to that one uh, a lot. Um, that was definitely a fan mm-hmm. favorite. It was fun to play. Um Mm-hmm. It was definitely mm-hmm. one in our live shows that we saved for a special moment. And of course, Peter uh, Frampton played uh, lead guitar on the recorded version of that. So that one is a very special one for me. Um, but that's awesome. And then, of course, the 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 apotheosis moment um, <laughs> for me would be a very recent song um, that I wrote for my wife, Lindsay. Um, mm-hmm. right when she was uh, diagnosed with ovarian cancer, um, the song uh, Every Someday is Now and Always. And that's the one that we we worked on our, our music video together. Um, and the, the mm-hmm. idea of being able to learn more about somebody by seeing through their creativity, um, the way your mind thinks, the way your soul is, the, 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 way, you, the way you paint, the way you draw, whatever it is. I want to get closer to you. So in order to do that, I'm going to try to see things through your eyes. Um, Mm -hmm. I thought that that was a a great way to to say, I love you. And I want to love you even more if that's possible. But also Mm -hmm. with so much of the question mark of what was going on, um, another song that pretty much was already written except for a couple of little bumpy moments that I just, I couldn't figure out the way to say some things that would be like the best I could say them. And I asked a buddy of mine, Bobby Taylor, (laughs) who's a great singer songwriter in town to help me out with a couple of phrases here and there. So he, he's got about 5%, 10% co-write on that one for really being, (laughs) uh, to, to helping sort of edit that one. I, I felt it needed to be as perfect as perfect can be in my world, right? Um, right. So those right. would be the three, um, and all for different reasons. But songs, to me, if you put them all those three hundred songs in chronological order, you basically have the soundtrack to my life. Because mm-hmm. you're storytelling through your work always, and I write what I know. Right. That's right. what I do. I write what I know. Hmm. Hmm. Well, from writing songs hoping that girls would like you to finishing with writing a song 
for a woman who is in love and in marriage with you, mm-hmm. I think that describes a really good path. I finally got it right. <laughs> I guess, I guess you it may was have a... been getting, you know, partial credit along the way. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> Here and there. Uh, and what are your, you talked about a book of poetry. Yeah. Um, what else do you imagine as your next projects regarding your, your songwriting? So, yeah, I, I want to do the compilation of the lyrics as a poetry book, um, just the lyrics alone, just to see, mm-hmm. you know, how mm-hmm. that reads. Um, obviously not repeating the chorus four or five times the way it might be in the recorded version. It only needs to be said <laughs> once, but, uh, you know, Maybe. That's, that's rock and roll. Um, I thought that would be a nice thing. It's really just for me. Like I, I, I just started to archive it. I wanted to, I wanted to have a way to have it all in one place so yeah. that I, I yeah. could say, here's a book that maybe I'll, I'll be the only person that's going to read. Um, and are you thinking in terms of more albums or are you going just sort of song by song? Well, I did this project of, of a bunch of singles, not a new album, as I called it, during the COVID time, re- recording, you know, writing, recording, uh, mixing, mastering and releasing one song at a time uh, just to get stuff done, just to get it out of my system and uh-huh. to keep creating. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I hear that. But yeah. I, I pretty much have once I finish this one that I'm working on now, I pretty much have a catalog of stuff that I think would make a great album. And I think that this would be worth putting together as a full project and cool. and releasing. I, I'm going back and forth on, now I know CDs are sort of antiquated, but it also gives me something tangible that I could have at the shows, I can hand to people if they want me to autograph it, that would be nice. Dude, vinyl is back. Right. And then the other side is, you know, I have an I have a record player. Um, I have a whole uh, vinyl collection here at my house. Um, I'm on the fence. I feel like a limited edition um, yeah. vinyl pressing yeah. might be fun, too. I miss the full size album or, or CDs, covers or CDs. Well, maybe yeah, both, yeah, I but, know what you mean. but but I but I miss the album cover art. You know, like I I miss that. Yeah, it's another way to it's it's another way to frame what you're saying. Yeah, so that's kind of where I am. I, I and also <laughs> we're about to do a very funny music video to support yeah. the previous song that I just uh, uh, finished up, which is a real sort of 80s style dance pop tune. Um, so that's going to be a lot of fun. And I'm going to do you that. You shared with me your, your yeah. concept and yeah. I love it. And it's uh, like, I just, I'm all about the multimedia side of, of the stuff that we can do. I'm all about the, the, you know, whatever creative way that we can get our stuff out there. I, I enjoy that. I feel like this would be a, a great album that I would like everything that's on it because I really worked on the songs in a different way than I normally do, which is start to finish right, right, for right. each one. So they really are their own thing. Like, I can't go back to that first one. It's already been released. It's out there, right? Mm-hmm. But so mm-hmm. I'm basically just going to stitch them all together and say, well, the continuity is I'm the songwriter and it's my voice. Otherwise, these songs are in so many different styles. I mean, it's, you know, it's like... It's like how, some of my favorite bands of all time, the Beatles, you know, the Bee Gees, great songwriters. You know, you listen to their catalog of material and it's like, well, they're not all the same. They, they, these no these things are all no. over the place. Or or one of your favorite yeah. artists, uh, Peter, Peter Gabriel. It's like, sure. you know, if you took songs, one song from every one of his albums and put them all on one album, you'd, you'd say, well, these are cool songs, but they don't all sound <laughs> right, like the same artist. What? <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> right. Well, even like uh, somebody who's you know considered more mainstream, uh, this is still an older reference. But Billy Joel, uh, sure, his Glass Houses. Even that album has a lot of variation. There's one song that's entirely in French. Yes, I think, and that's yeah. And I, I, you know, when you when you approach an album and not you're just releasing singles. You know, I still yeah, take yeah. the time to sequence yeah. the stuff. I want to take you on a flow uh, of, you know. A, sure. A, a, That's a, right. I love that approach. Right. I love that approach. I don't know if people still listen that way, but I like to do that. I want to I want to hear that journey, yeah. you know, that you want to take me on as, as a musician. Um, to me, that's a fun experience. I don't want 10 songs that all sound like that same <laughs> song. I want that one right, song right, in French, right, or right, I, I don't right. need all the songs in French unless that's what I'm in the mood for. Right, right. But but yeah, I agree with you. And yeah, Billy Joel, Elton John, all of the, I mean, great song. David Bowie. There's a yeah, great there's a great new documentary uh, yeah, on him. Uh, and Bowie, course. it's like yeah. talk about someone that you kept reinventing himself. I mean, all over the place. And yet, you know, I would listen to the best of Bowie because 
It's the best of Bowie. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, um, thank you for sharing your time with me today. Yeah. But, uh, but more importantly, all of this wonderful stuff related to what really defines you as a person to yourself. Wow. You are a, a singer-songwriter who has had recognition in other fields for other things. But this is the most important part of you, the most essential part of you. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it's it's really great to hear more about what that process has been and uh, how you go about it and uh, also where you see it taking you in, into the future. And I'm looking forward to that 80s video. I said I'd help you do the video yes. compositing for that. It's so. going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> it's, it's an adorable, ad- yeah. uh, adorable idea. Well, thank, thank you for <laughs> and, asking um, the questions today, my friend. For I appreciate sure, it. For sure. And this won't be the last time that we talk about music with you. But this was a really great uh, sort of foundational way of people getting an understanding of, of what that part of your life is to you and, and, and all of that. Yes. So... All right. Well, thanks to you, and also thanks to our listeners and followers. We are so flattered that you are here to listen to these conversations week after week, and we love the feedback that you've been giving us, Uh, and we welcome any feedback, uh, positive or negative, and we will have some more conversations with creative people, that some of which you might recognize, others we are excited to introduce to you, and as always, we look forward to any time we can have a conversation about creativity, inspiration, and dealing with what you're dealt. Thanks for listening to The Heart of the Cards with Dan Green and Eric Stewart. We hope this conversation in some way spoke to you. Whatever your journey, we look forward to crossing paths again in the next episode. This is Veronica Taylor, and on behalf of Adromeda Productions, we wish you well. Andromeda, always a sound choice.